wonderful thought to think that our Lord might actually come this year. What a tremendous blessing, what a tremendous privilege to know that Christ is, in fact, coming again. And we may be the generation that's alive to see his coming. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. We're in Exodus chapter 15, looking at verses 22 through 27. Exodus 15, verses 22 through 27. Now, in just a few moments, uh, I am going to be interrupting my sermon for a special presentation because all the people who are involved in that presentation are not here yet, but they will be here, the Lord willing, in just a couple of minutes. And so um, we will stop what we are doing and we will make a presentation at that point. And I hope you have an idea of what that's all about. It, there's something in your bulletin today that might give you a hint as to what we're going to be doing at that point. But as we've been looking here at Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi in the Desert, parts 1 through 13 so far, today is number 14, what we have learned is that Israel rebelled 10 times during their wilderness wanderings, and God cut them off at that point. God is a God of infinite mercy and kindness, but God is also a God who sets limits. We need to remember that. The God of heaven does set limits. Now, I just saw someone walking by that direction there. Not quite sure who that was. Uh, maybe somebody could check it. I saw a head go by there. Oh, here we go. That must have been who it was. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. No, there comes another head. Okay. Many heads coming by that window. All right. That God is a God of forgiveness and infinite mercy, but God is also a God who sets limits. He's a God of judgment. And now it comes time for the judgment because people are here. Well, what is the judgment? The judgment is a very good one. The judgment today is certificates of excellence and outstanding accomplishment for Bible reading completion in 2017. That all men know by these presents that <laughs> is hereby awarded the certificate of completion for having read the entire Bible consisting of the Old Testament and New Testament during the calendar year of our Lord, 27, uh, 20, 2017, however you say that, A.D., as part of the Bible reading program of the Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood, New Jersey, in witness whereof I hereby affix my signature this seventh day of January in the year of our Lord, 2018. Pastor Christian S. Spencer. And the first goes to Shirley Lee. Shirley, stand up. You're getting a reward. <laughs> Here you go. And it's on parchment paper, even. Okay. And the same goes to Julia Myers. Julia, come on, stand up and come up this way. See, when I disappear from behind the pulpit, the people on the internet can't see that there's actually anybody here. Congratulations. All right. Give them a hand. We encourage all of you to do that. That's why you've got that little pink sheet in your bulletin, which gives you a Bible reading program for the entire year. If you follow that, you will read through the entire Bible in one year, and I trust that many of you will do that. And some of you might even be able to do it two or three times if you read a lot of Bible. So, here we are. Bitter waters and sweet, Naomi in the desert. God, a God of infinite mercy, yet God, a God who sets limits. You cannot get away with your sin forever. In fact, you say, well, yeah, I know, but I'll, I'll sin until... Uh, you know, I know I'm about to die, and then I'll repent, and I'll confess everything. I'll get it all right with... No, no. Did you know that God might kill you sooner than you think? God might take you home. God might say, okay, this person's a believer, but they've been living for the devil. And because they're living for the devil, and they're living for the world, and they're living for the flesh, I'm not going to let them play on my team anymore. I'm going to take them home. I'm going to jerk them off the field. I'm going to put them on the bench. God does that kind of thing, and that's the main thrust of the ten different complaints where Israel rebelled against God in the wilderness wanderings. God finally said it's enough. And after the ten times of rebellion in the wilderness, God said, everybody age 20 and over who left Egypt at age 20 and over, all of them are going to die in the wilderness. You know, they not only died in the wilderness, they wasted 40 years of life. Stop and think about that. 
How old are you? Subtract 40 from that. Can you imagine that those years didn't count for anything for God? 40 years totally wasted at the end of which you die. Not a very pleasant thought. And yet, the New Testament tells us that these things in the Old Testament were written for our edification upon whom the ends of the world are come. These things are written for us so that we might follow the example or not follow the example of those who sinned against God or those who were obedient to God. Heroes of faith versus believers who walked in the flesh and died in the flesh. Serious issues. That's what we're looking at as we look here at these principles of rebellion against God in the wilderness. And we saw that that's a very common occurrence. We saw that it is also warned against in the New Testament. We saw rebellion against Paul. We saw rebellion against John. God makes it very clear that he does not tolerate that no matter what period of history in which we are living. Now we saw the bitter waters at Mara, that's in Exodus 15 where we are, and we talked about how that relates to Naomi and her wilderness experience. And we saw that Naomi had done the same thing that Israel did. She blamed God for the problems that she faced. We looked at Joseph, and we saw that Joseph didn't blame God for the problems he faced. In Genesis 50, he, in fact, understood that God was designing his time of being betrayed by his brothers, his time of suffering their hatred, being sold as a slave, being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He understood that even after he spent years in prison for a crime he did not commit, and after he was miraculously delivered and had power, he was willing to forgive because he understood that God had a purpose in it. When bad things come into your life, understand that God has a purpose in it. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. God is sovereign, but God is not capricious. Joseph had learned to trust God in every circumstance of life, even the circumstances that looked very, very bad. Because we can always depend upon the promises of God. Go back to the word of God. Don't go back to your emotions. Don't go back to reason. Don't go back to philosophy. Go back to the word of God and find the promises of God and rely on the promises of God and you'll have peace, no matter how bad the circumstances of life become. We also talked about the walk of faith as being essential to a productive, joyful Christian life. If you don't walk by faith, then you will not have a protective life. If you're always trying to see everything in advance, you will not have a productive life. If you're always trying to reason it out and make sure that you've got a plan B instead of trusting God, that you can always fall back on something else, you're not going to have a productive Christian life. There is only one plan, and that plan is the center of the will of God. Always walk by faith. Always walk in obedience to the word of God. Always walk in obedience to the will of God. Always walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Those are four different ways that the Bible explains to us that we are to live the Christian life. And when we do that, we'll see that in the long run, it may not seem like it in the middle, but in the long run, God will accomplish in our lives that which we could never have imagined possible. So learn to walk that way. Learn to walk by faith. In fact, we notice that failure to walk by faith is actually a point of rebellion in the eyes of God because you're trusting something or someone else instead of trusting him. We see what an incredible premium God placed on the walk of faith when we look at Hebrews chapter 11. That's the heroes of faith chapter. And you, if you walk by faith, have your name added to that list. Imagine that. Some of you have been to Washington and seen the memorial wall there of all the soldiers who fell in various wars, especially the Vietnam War, and their names are there. It's a big, long list. Big, long list. You've been to other places, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. I hope you've been to some of these places anyway. Uh, you've been to different places where there are memorials. You've been perhaps to the Arlington Military Cemetery, and you've seen tombstone after tombstone with names inscribed on them. Now imagine a great wall and you have the men who are the heroes of faith and the women who are the heroes of faith here in Hebrews chapter 11 on that wall. You begin to read down that wall and you read the names of Christians who lived in the first century and in the second century and in the third century and in the fourth century and the fifth century and the sixth century. And you come again 
7th century, 8th century, 9th century, 10th century, halfway to us. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And you get to the 20th century and you begin to see some names that you recognize. And you get to the 21st century and your name's not there. Oh, people, the list of Hebrews 11 is not complete. These are men and women who walk by faith. God has commanded it. God has empowered it. God has placed you in circumstances so that you can exercise it. And if you refuse to do so, you are in rebellion against God and you will pay a consequence. For Israel, it was death in the wilderness after 40 years of wasted life. All the years they'd spent in Egypt, wasted life. 40 years in the wilderness, wasted life. Dead. Never inheriting the promises. Never seeing the blessing of God. Knowing that he was there day by day, eating the manna. Always being provided with water wherever they went because the the rock that followed them was Christ. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which always provided water for them all the way through the wilderness wanderings. And they died in the wilderness. They never got into the promised land. They didn't stand on the banks of the Jordan River. They didn't see the river part. They didn't see the children of Israel go across by faith, and by faith conquer the cities of the land. They lost it all. Dear people, that's one of the lessons that we have to learn about rebellion. When we refuse to walk by faith, God counts it as rebellion. So what are the principles that we've looked at so far? First point of rebellion that we looked at taught multiple lessons, but the principal point of rebellion, which God counted as charge number one in his death sentence against the adult Jews was rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God. The second point of rebellion that God counted as charge number two in the death sentence of the adult Israelites was what we're looking at now, refusing to walk by faith is rebellion against God. That's a habitual lifestyle, walking by faith. It's not every now and then you have a little glimmer of faith. You walk by faith. It's a habitual lifestyle of the believer. That brings us now to the third instance of rebellion, which is rebellion at the wilderness of sin. This comes out of Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Again, the concerns of the Israelites, as with all, almost all the other rebellions, the, the things that they that worried about them. You know, people, we tend to worry. You know, every time you worry, you are not trusting God. Every time you worry, you are not trusting God. You need to learn to relax in his omnipotent hands. In times of sorrow, rest in his omnipotent hands. In times of suffering, rest in his omnipotent hands. In times of want and need, rest in his omnipotent hands. Because not only are his hands omnipotent, his hands are the loving hands of the Savior who died for you. If God gives us Christ and everything in Christ, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? What a magnificent God we serve, and yet we don't trust him. Wilderness of sin. Again, the concerns of the Israelites are totally carnal, selfish, self-serving, and focus exclusively on personal comfort. How often are we concerned about our personal comfort and will give up all kinds of things for personal comfort? Again, we see the rebellion against the intermediate God-ordained, God-appointed, God-qualified leader, which shows up in tandem with many of the points of rebellion when God killed the adults for committing them. We're here in chapter 16, verses 1 and following. They took their journey from Elim, 
and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. So here they are griping against God's ordained leadership again. It happens frequently. And the children of Israel said unto them, now get this. How many of you ever said something like this? Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots. Is that totally carnal or what? Man, we were eating good when we did eat bread to the full. For you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. <laughs> oh, how we tend to complain. They griped about water. Now they're griping about food. We don't like the water we got. Okay, we'll give you some really nice water. Now they're griping. We don't like the food because we had better food in Egypt. Man, I can remember when I was a pagan. I had so much fun. I ate so much good food. Man, I'd go to the bar every night and I'd have a good drink and I'd watch the football game up on that big TV screen up there and we'd have hot wings and... That's Israel. That's the church. New Testament says, whose God is their belly, who mind earthly things. Is your belly your God? Is that what controls you? Is that what motivates you? Is that what gives you the vibes? Oh man, I gotta eat at that restaurant. It is really a good restaurant. I'm sure tired of Burger King. I'm sure tired of McDonald's. I'm sure tired of eating whatever it is that God put on your table. Now most of us here in America have never really been hungry. I mean, I suppose there are some people who've been hungry for different reasons. But I don't think there's anybody in this room, at least looking at us, doesn't look like we've been hungry for very long. Here we have it. Would to God that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. God says, well, I'll kill you, but it's not going to be in Egypt. It was pleasant in Egypt. It would have been a fun place to die. But I'm going to kill you in the wilderness. You see, that's what happened to the people who griped and complained and moaned and groaned and belly ached because they didn't like what God was doing. They didn't like what God provided. They didn't like the manna, which we're told in the book of Psalms is angel's food. They wanted the stuff of the world. How many times do you and I want the stuff of the world instead of wanting what God provides, which is always best for us? Talk about an incredible diet. Water from the rock that was Christ. Angels food from heaven every morning. Supernaturally provided. And you didn't have to lug it around with you and store it someplace because it would turn into rot and worms. It would be there every day. God has promised the same thing for us. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Everything that you have a need for. He has promised to provide it. That means from day one all the way to the day of your death. God has promised to provide for your needs. And you know, you say, well, but sometimes I, I, I didn't have as much as I needed. Maybe you wasted what God gave you. Have you ever wasted resources? Book of Proverbs tells us that the sloth is the brother to him that is a great waster. Do you know that God hates for you to waste resources? You've looked into your refrigerator and said, well, here's some leftovers that are two days old, and, you know, I really don't want to eat the same thing again. You threw the leftovers out. Perfectly good to eat. Folks, that was a resource God entrusted to you, and so you spent money that God gave you to use for something else. Do you waste resources that God gives you? Resources of time, resources of energy, 
resources of finance, resources of material items. You say, well, I think I don't like last year's clothes. You know, it's not quite in style. So you dump all the clothes. They still fit you. They got no holes in them. They're not worn out. They're just like the clothes of the Israelites in the wilderness wanderings. The shoes still, you know, those lasted for 40 years. They never got any holes in their clothes. They never wore out. Their sandals never wore out after walking for 40 years in the desert. God supernaturally provided. But you look at the, the clothing that you've got. And you say, well, I think I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to go out and I'm going to have a shopping spree. I'm going to buy me a whole bunch of new stuff. Wait a minute. Whose resources is that that you've got? Is that your resources? Or is that God's? resources <laughs> I'm going to tell you something personal I'm still wearing several pair of socks I've worn out most of them but several pair of socks that I had in high school and folks that was a long time ago <laughs> in fact that was before the flood it's amazing I brought gotten through the flood but anyway <laughs> I try not to waste anything that God has entrusted to me because as a steward, I must give account for everything that God allows to pass through my hands. And so will you. What has God put into your hands? What have you wasted? Because you complained you wanted something better or something different. See, that's the problem that we have with the children of Israel in the wilderness. With them, it happened to be they didn't like what God gave them, which was manna. What they wanted is some kind of flesh. Oh, I wish we died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots. Can you imagine wishing to die because you've got angel food and not chicken meat? I mean, is that stupid or is that stupid? But they think, well, God would never do that to us. We just want to make our point with Moses. We want to put a big exclamation point on the end of our sentence. Would to God that we died by the hand of the Lord. Now, they, if they'd wanted to die in Egypt, Pharaoh would have gladly accom you know, accommodated them. They were standing there by the Red Sea, and what were they doing? They were screaming and yelling and praying that God would do something to save them. If they wanted to die in the land of Egypt, they could have died in the land of Egypt. You know, if they'd have prayed this prayer right then, and God had removed his presence of the Shekinah glory from between Pharaoh and his army and the Israelites, they could have died in the land of Egypt. How many times do we say things that we don't really mean, but we think, oh, we'll never have to give account for it. You know what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Every idle word that men shall speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. What is it that comes out of your mouth? Listen to what they're saying. Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt? But we want to die in comfort. We don't want to die out here. Because they say died while we were sitting by the flesh pots. We're sitting at the table. We're having this big, big meal in front of us. It seems to me that they didn't have lots of really good food in Egypt. Pharaoh was oppressing them in Egypt, but that's not what they remember. Oh, and we have this big meal, and we fold our hands and close our eyes, and poof, off to heaven. Well, they thought they were going to heaven anyway. How do you treat the resources that God has given you? When we did eat bread to the full. Oh man, I can smell that bed breaking right now. Bread baking, not bed breaking. <laughs> bread baking in the oven. And that aroma comes, man, I remember the homemade bread that my family used to make. We, when we lived up in North Jersey, we'd go to Lancaster County every year and buy a thousand pounds of stone ground flour and my wife and kids would bake bread almost every day. And we'd buy wheat flour, we'd buy rye flour, we'd buy oats. We bought all kinds of cool stuff. And there was always the smell of baking bread in our house. Oh, you know what? I'm glad I didn't die then. <laughs> That's what they're saying. They say, we wish we had died back when we had lots of bread. 
Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And God said, well, you want to die? I'll kill you. And he did in the wilderness. So that brings us to two connected instances of manna and quail. Manna and quail, which each have distinct points of rebellion. That's why we have two instances of them, for which God killed the adults, some of whom he killed on the spot. When he got the manna and the quail, um, or the, the quail, uh, these instances deal primarily with one of the so-called seven deadly sins, which is the sin of gluttony. Did you know it's still one of the deadly sins? Now, you heard me preach on the seven deadly sins and everything that not just the Old Testament, but what the New Testament says about those sins and how they are not just deadly. The reason they're given the name deadly is because those are things that bring about the death of believers who insist on rebelling against God in those areas. The sin of gluttony. Let's read the first one. It's over in Exodus chapter 16, verses 11 and following. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak ye unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread. So, what were the two things? Oh, we, we were sitting by the flesh pots of Egypt. <laughs> we're going to talk about the flesh pots of Egypt in a later, later message. Now, what in the world all is involved in that concept of flesh pots. Some of you know that that's a term that's used in modern society for immoral women, uh, flesh pots. But anyway, here he, God says, okay, I'm going to give you flesh. At even you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. <clears throat> and it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, Mana, what's that? For they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord your God hath given to you to eat. Now, you know what happened to them? They ate the quails. And it says, While the meat was still between their teeth, God sent a plague and killed them. Let me read you the second part of this in verse 25 and following. Moses said, Eat that today, for today is the Sabbath day, speaking of the uh, manna. Today you shall not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. Duh. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? Do you understand? That when you don't do things God's way, God says it is rebellion. See, but I've got a better way to do it. God said, look, you're going to find it on six days. You're not going to find it on the seventh day. Don't bother to store it up because it, it won't work for you. You'll find out why in just a second. But don't go out on the seventh day. It won't be there because that's a sabbath how long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws see for that the lord hath given you the sabbath therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days abide ye every man in his place let no man go out of his place on the seventh day now there are a number of principles involved here obviously one of them is gluttony which we'll talk about in a minute but the second one is hoarding. We're not talking about wise planning because God tells us to plan wisely. We're talking about hoarding. Hoarding is a very common sin among Christians. We'll be reading in a moment that some of these people went out and they saw it on the first day and they said, man, I don't know if this is ever going to happen again. We're going to get as much of this stuff as we possibly can. And they kept it overnight and it rotted. God was teaching them the principle of daily provision daily provision and he was also teaching them the principle of the sabbath which was given to israel so that on the seventh day which has not been transferred to the first day on the seventh day they were to rest he said i don't even want you going out and picking up your breakfast on the sabbath it's not going to be there don't go out on the sabbath day some have said well you know, we were really surprised that it showed up six days in a row. That means it's probably a natural occurrence. I mean, it's just some kind of scientific phenomenon that's happening right now. So it'll happen tomorrow morning too. 
and they went out, and there wasn't any. We need to learn to believe what God says and to believe he says what he wants to say with precision. He doesn't stutter. He doesn't stumble. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't have to go back and correct himself. What he says, he means, and we can take it at face value. That's what he means. So hoarding, not merely wise planning, but is very common among Christians. Some of you are hoarders. You collect rubbish until you have so many piles of stuff you don't have any room for it. You stuff it into your houses until you have no room to walk. You pack it into storage lockers and other buildings because you have no more room at your own houses. Hoarding is a visible manifestation of another of the seven deadly sins. The sin of covetousness. The reason that God killed the Israelites in the wilderness for the manifestation of covetousness is that it proved that they were not worshiping him as God alone. You say, why is this so serious with God? Because covetousness proves you are not worshiping God alone and you're not trusting God alone. You're trusting your own ingenuity, your own resources, your own deep-seated desire for stuff. They were not worshiping him as the true God who could meet all their needs. Hoarding is a manifestation, an outward manifestation of covetousness, and it means that you have a false God. It means that you are expecting that God to meet that particular false God to meet your needs rather than having the God of heaven meet your needs. Hear what the Apostle Paul says about covetousness. Hoarding is a visible sign of covetousness. This is what Paul says. In fact, he says it twice in Colossians and also in Ephesians. When Christ, who is our life, this is Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, that means put to death. Kill, therefore, your members that are upon the earth. And here they are. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, which means evil desires. And listen, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Did you get that? Covetousness is idolatry. For the which thing's sake? What are you talking about? What things? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. Five things he's listed. He says, For which thing's sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Those are the things that characterize the pagans. Those are the things that characterize the unbelievers. And God pours out his wrath on them because of fornication. God pours out his wrath on them because of uncleanness. God pours out his wrath on them because of inordinate affection. God pours out his wrath upon them because of evil concupiscence. God pours out his wrath on them because of covetousness. So Paul says, put those things to death in your life. Don't have anything to do with those things. Because the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. He says, now I know, that used to be your way that you used to live, but you became Christians. And when you became Christians, there's supposed to be a transformation of your life. Listen to what he says in the next verse. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Before you guys were saved, that's the way you used to live. Those are the things that used to eat you up. All those lusts and dirty thoughts and love for things that you ought not to love and evil desires and covetousness. That used to eat you up when you were pagans, when you were unsaved, when you were lost. Don't do it anymore because those are things that brings the wrath of God down on you. Just like it brings the wrath of God down on the pagans who do those things. Don't do them with the pagans. Listen to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. But fornication, here we go to the same list. Fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. In other words, those are not things that enhance the life of a believer. You are a saint, whether you know it or not, if you've trusted Christ. That means a set-apart one. That doesn't mean that you're sinlessly perfect in this life, but that means that God has set you apart to salvation and he sets you apart from the rest of the world, the flesh, the devil, the demons. He's put a hedge of protection around you. Quit dabbling outside again in that stuff. 
fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know, verse 5, here it is, this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, now hear the words, who is an idolater. A covetous man is an idolater. Hoarding is the visible manifestation of covetousness. If covetousness is in your heart, I can't see it. Nobody else can see it. God can see it, but nobody else can see it. How do other people see the sin? If you've got lust in your heart, I can't see it. God can see it. But how do you know when somebody has lust in their heart? Because you catch them watching pornography. You catch them involved in immorality. See, there are visible manifestations of invisible sins. Now, God counts those invisible sins just as serious. Jesus says, man looks on a woman to lust after he hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You know, you hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. But the visible manifestations, Israel is giving us illustrations of what's in the heart comes out in real life. This you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance. Ah, your inheritance is at stake. Hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. I think all of us would love to get a big inheritance. Millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. We'd love to get some great big huge estate somewhere with this mansion and lots of servants that run around and you know do everything that we want them to do and we have enough money to pay them really well so they won't never leave and they'll always be really obedient because you know they don't want to lose that job and and we just we were just rolling in it and we didn't work for it it was an inheritance did you know that you are heirs and joint heirs with Christ did you know that someday you're going to get heavenly rewards for obedience to the Word of God, for walking by faith, walking in the Spirit, walking well-pleasing unto the Lord, walking in holiness, walking in the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Well, the Bible talks a lot about walking. There's going to be an inheritance. There are going to be rewards. There's going to be a day of reading the will, so to speak. Will you have lost it? Nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. There are people who say, ah, pooey. Forget what Pastor Spencer says. No, 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 you can forget what I say. Remember what Paul said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Same thing he said back in, the, in Colossians. But listen, he adds one more phrase. Be not ye, therefore, partakers with them. When you got saved, Christ called you out of darkness into light. Christ called you from death into life. The Holy Spirit came to live inside your body, which is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if any man defile the temple of the Holy Spirit, him will God destroy. Scripture says so. Not Pastor Spencer. The Bible says so. You have been called to be separate. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The believer who thinks he has it all down here 
He's covetous. That's what he's focused on, material things all his life or her life. Who's hoarded? Who has not used the resources as a steward but rather as an owner? It says... that man will not have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Friends, those are serious words. And Israel is specifically given to us, it says so three times in the New Testament, is specifically given to us as an illustration of how not to live if we want God's blessing. And how if we live the way Israel did, we will come under the chastening hand of God, which in the case of Israel meant 10 strikes against you and you're dead. 40 years of wasted life and death without inheritance. You see, the promised land was their inheritance. They never got their inheritance. I pray that that might not be the case with us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It's very practical. Most time preachers don't like to make applications, and I don't like it either. But Father, if we don't make the application, we'll all think we're fine and go away about our merry lives thinking somebody else is at fault. Father, we need to understand that we ourselves need to do self-examination to see whether or not there is any wicked way in us and to confess our sins, to repent of them, to turn from them, not merely to say, yes, I've done it wrong and I'll keep on doing it, but to repent, to turn from it, to walk on the right path, to walk in ways of holiness. Father, take your word, apply it to each one of us as you see fit, and in such a way that Jesus Christ is honored and glorified and that we might receive a full inheritance. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.